The Witcher is an action fantasy drama television series created by Lauren Schmidt Hisrick for Netflix, based on the book series of the same name. It stars British actor Henry Cavill as Geralt of Rivia. In this upcoming series of videos about the Witcher costumes, we're digging deep into some of the themes, cultural and historical influences about the costume design created for the screen by British costume designer Tim Aslam. A large part of this video will include segments of my interview with Tim and will feature the costumes of Sintra. Warning, there are season one spoilers. There was a recent exhibit in Italy at Luca Comics and Games, Europe's own version of Comic-Con, and many of the design team, including Tim Aslam, were there. Blogger Redanian Intelligence did an excellent piece on the exhibit, including the description from the exhibit plaques that I'll share with you as well. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to check out their blog after you watch this video. Regarding his design process for the costumes on The Witcher, Tim Aslam says, I started with in-depth discussions with showrunner Lauren Hisrick about the kind of look and feel she wanted for the show. I came up with a concept which was a mix of contemporary high fashion with gothic influences from all the periods where gothic resurged in fashion history, notably the 1890s and 1930s, plus a lot of ethnic world costume. Tim says, The Witcher is set, after all, in a kind of parallel fantasy world where anything is possible. I have always particularly loved 1930s fashion, Tim tells me, so it was ideal to be able to bring in the 30s gothic feel, along with a little film noir feel, to some of the characters' costumes. The influences came from a variety of designers of the time, v a Fortuny and Alex Barton, plus Scaparelli, Lucien Lelon, Maria Monacci Galenge, and a touch of Joan Crawford. Tim's fascination with Gothic Revival isn't surprising. He said, I was also a big fan of film, particularly early Hollywood and European movies from the 1930s onward. Gothic Revival, sometimes called Neo-Gothic or Victorian Gothic, was an architectural movement that saw a revival of medieval Gothic architecture. In turn, this movement also influenced art, music, literature, and clothing. It was in stark contrast to the neoclassical movement that saw us through the early 1800s. What's interesting about Gothic Revival clothing is that both the 1890s and 1930s share many similarities with each other, but also borrow aspects from medieval, although not directly. Fashion writer Dolores Monet writes that, Aesthetic fashion, as we see during the aesthetic movement, cast off the stiffly tailored garments of Victorian styles to embrace softer, more comfortable clothing based on the historic costume of medieval times. The aesthetics viewed corsets and the rigidity of the day as unattractive and artificial. It was, in essence, a fashion revolution. Monet adds that, instead of stiff bodices, the women wore long, flowing dresses with soft pleats, folds, and smocking. Dresses offered few embellishments, unlike the heavily trimmed, ruffled, or braided edges often seen in mid-19th century clothing. Dyes were natural vegetable dyes. The ascetics hated the new, manufactured aniline dyes. Colors were muted, natural tones of brown, terracotta, russet red, cobalt, or indigo blue, and sage or moss green. Now, historicism is a great way to explain this concept. Historicism comprises of artistic styles that draw their inspiration from recreating historic styles or imitating the work of historic artisans. Author and jewelry designer Alice Ciccolini wrote an excellent piece titled Historicism and Historical Revival. In it, she says that trends were rarely based on historical accuracy, relying primarily on a nostalgic imagination and secondhand source material. 
As an example, this painting shows the influence of the decorative and purely sensual ideals of late 19th century aestheticism and the pre-Raphaelite preoccupation with the medieval. Sintra embodies this channeling of a medieval nostalgia while not actually being a purely medieval setting. Here's Tim Aslam's mood board for Sintra. He tells me that Sintra was to be rich ethereal colors, golds, bronzes, silvers, and jewel colors. Also, a lot of the background in Sintra were based on medieval Slavic robes as well as the look of the crowd. Calanthe, Queen of Sintra, is also the mother of Pavetta and grandmother of Ciri. Many of the Gothic elements like we see in this silk bias-cut gown are primarily seen on Calanthe, Ciri, and the other women of the court. The gowns are devoid of elaborate trimmings similar to the styles of the 1930s. The Gothic simplicity is reminiscent of historical examples like the Diva Evening Dress by Jean Lovain. This 1930 silk velvet gown and this golden bias cut gown from American designer Valentina, who was inspired by Madeleine Vionnet. Tim also applied some modern techniques and fabrications, as we see from some of his inspiration in this mood board. Calante's dress is embellished around the neckline and sleeves with a technique called surface cording. We also see this same technique applied to Ciri's gown. Here's Tim's design of Queen Calanthe's gold gown. From the exhibit plaque at Luca Comics and Games, Calanthe's gold gown reads, As the Lioness of Sintra, Calanthe wears this dress to banquet after battle. It is made of gold sequins chosen to give the dress its feeling of chainmail as a reflection of Calanthe's strong juxtaposition of tradition and strength. She also wears a royal blue velvet cloak with Sintra's iconic gold embroidered lions. This close-up of the gold leather neck gorget features some modern fabric sewing techniques. In this behind the scenes photo, actor Jody May appears to be bathed in liquid gold. Here is an example of a 1930s metallic gold silk lame bias cut evening gown that has a similar effect. And here is a close-up of Calanthe's crown. This is Tim's design for Calanthe's gown from the flashback scene in episode four. While made of a beautiful brocade, it's the addition of beading around the torso, cape shoulders and wrists that create this almost armored feel. Cirilla Ortsiri, as she is called, is the sole princess of Sintra, the daughter of Pavetta and Queen Calanthe's granddaughter. We first see Ciri playing with some boys inside the castle walls of Sintra, but she's disguised as a boy, dressed in a simple doublet and knickers. She changes for court into this velvet gown. Here's Tim's design for the costume. The dress is made from a shot gray silk velvet with a bit of purple for punch. The silhouette is a callback to this style of evening gowns like this Madeleine Vionnet gown and this one by American designer Elizabeth Hawes who used similar design techniques. Both of these dresses are from the Met. This 1930s ivory silk velvet dress with its medieval influence is evocative of the silhouette of the 1930s. In this close-up, you see that the fullness of the dress is pleated along the bodice and the sleeves drawn in at the shoulders with some tight cartridge pleats. Ciri's travel outfit is a brocade doublet and split skirt trimmed with wide bands of contrasting fabric. The exhibit plaque reads that the skirt is actually a wide culotte pant, allowing for free movement as she faces her long journey to survive. The costume is functional, but still pretty enough for a princess. In this image, you can see the construction details of the doublet. Contrasting brocade sleeves tapered into a pin tuck detail and set into a tailored bronze bodice with a flat pleated peplum. The doublet is fastened at the center front with a row of metallic buttons. Here is Tim's design of Ciri's blue cloak, an outer garment that she wears for the remainder of the season. The plaque from the exhibit reads that 
the hooded sleeve cloak helps conceal her identity as Princess Sorella. A pleated swirling detail added to the back of the cloak gives it a personal touch of the beauty and otherworldly character that is Ciri. The blue cloak also gives Ciri a sort of an Alice in Wonderland type quality. Tim tells me that there was an intention to create this look for Ciri, to set her slightly apart from everyone else and convey the kind of confused wonder that she experiences during the season to this world that is alien to her. Here's a close-up of the delicate tone-on-tone soutache embroidery trimming the hood, shoulders, and the front of the cape. This is a similar technique that we see here on two vintage garments from the 1940s. Despite Siri having one costume to carry her throughout the season, Siri's runaway look has 12 repeats, according to Tim, which are at various stages of distress during her journey. And you can see how much brighter her costume is in real life. Tim said, I tried to pump up the color as much as possible, especially as once through breakdown and with use of filters, which darkened and desaturated the color about 40% is lost in some scenes. Princess Pavetta is the daughter of Queen Calanthe and the mother of Ciri. Pavetta only appears in episode seven in a flashback sequence wearing this dress. Tim says that Pavetta's dress had to be special. It was already described as emerald green. The fact that she is defiant of Calanthe's wishes as to whom she marries and then takes center stage when the action kicks off meant she had to be the focal point in the scene. The swirling cut of both the bodice and sleeve heads of the dress were a subtle indication of her powers. Here's Tim's design along with some inspiration from designers Ralph and Russo. The plaque from the exhibit states that the dress is cut to give a swirling effect over the bodice and sleeves and is embroidered with fine golden thread to catch the light. Its overskirts of fine golden vein silk intend to give it a floating effect when caught by a breeze. To add depth, the dress has a gentle ombre of darker green tones added to the hems of both the skirt and sleeves. Here are some examples of the type of modern pleating techniques used in the dress. The jewelry worn by Pavetta, along with many in the Corte Centra, are exquisite. Tim says that, I purchased a lot of jewelry in Turkey from a supplier I had also used in the past on black sales. Pavetta's jewelry is similar to the style of South Indian jewelry. King Ice Tursik is husband to Queen Calanthe and step-grandfather of Cirilla. Iced wears this high-waisted skirted doublet with a matching cape. He wears his travel outfit when he returns to Sintra to find Calanthe in a quarrel with Geralt in episode four. Here it is on display in Italy. Like Ciri's cloak, you can see how much more vivid the costume is. Tim's own background in tailoring informed this costume. The exhibit plaque states that it is made with a textured, heavy upholstery velvet influenced by medieval robes, Eastern touches, and a nod to contemporary fashion. Like many of the clever fabric techniques used in the show, Tim tells me that I had a pretty good idea that the basis of the look for the show would be fabric manipulation rather than just adding trim to spice up a garment. In most cases, I had a direction, but then with the respective cutters, we played around with different fabric manipulation twall shapes for sleeves, etc. Ice wore the same doublet in the throne room in episode one. The team used this technique for the collar and took inspiration for the sleeve treatment from Chanel. Meanwhile, Ice wore this brocade skirted doublet in the flashback scene in episode four for Pavetta's betrothal. Here is Tim's design of King Ice's Asian inspired coat, originally designed in blue and then the actual costume in gold. For the sleeves, Tim once again took inspiration from Chanel. Mausak is the court druid of Sintra and advisor to Queen Calanthe. His gold costume immediately caught my eye and like many of the men's costumes is one of my favorite. This type of garment is often referred to as a hoopalant, which is an outer garment for both men and women from the Middle Ages. 
I've mentioned it previously in some of my other videos. Here's Tim's design, along with some of his historical references, including this one rare example from the 14th century that informed his design. This funerary hoopalond, sometimes called the Prague hoopalond, is thought to be one of the oldest known hoopalons in existence, dating to 1396 from the Czech Republic. And here are some images of the costume in the wardrobe at the finishing stages. While Tim took some inspiration from contemporary fashion, this style of overly long ruched sleeves was also all the rage in the late 19th century, like how we see on these Liberty & Co. medieval-inspired dresses. In the next video, we'll get more into the Sintron armor, and you'll also learn what Tim Aslam had to say about the Nilfgaardian armor. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.